do you deal with your anger? A few months ago, I received a text from our neighbor in Bakersfield. Leif and I still own our home there. We rent it out actually to a pastor's family. And the house has this big, beautiful tree in the front, which if you've ever been to Bakersfield, you know that's worth its weight in gold because Bakersfield is very hot <laughs> and that provides a lot of shade for the house. But my neighbor was texting me because evidently our tree was growing over onto her property. And the text was less than friendly, contained some interesting language, and more than one threat that if we didn't cut the tree in time, she would report us to the HOA and possibly even call the police. So this was the first time I had heard from this neighbor in over a year, the only time she's ever complained about the tree. So I was a little taken aback by the text. It was very clear from the text that she was angry with me. And as I read and reread the text, I could feel the anger bubbling up inside me. And with every thought, it seemed to grow a little more. She didn't, mean, she didn't need to be so mean about it. Anger. Just pick up the phone and call me, lady. <laughs> Resentment. <laughs> How dare she be angry with me? She shouldn't treat people like that. More anger. <laughs> And with every time I read the text, every thought that came to my mind, the more I talked to Leaf about it, the more anger started to boil inside of me until I was in an anger spiral. Have you ever been there? <laughs> Glad I'm not alone. <laughs> How do you deal with your anger? Relationships are complicated. And every time there are people there is potential for conflict. When that conflict breeds anger and resentment, what are we supposed to do with that? How are we supposed to deal with our anger? We're in a series called Reformed, where we take a deep dive into Jesus's teachings on the Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew 5 through 7. And we're talking about how we have all been formed by this world around us. And Jesus calls us as his disciples to be reformed into the values and character and teachings of Jesus. So two weeks ago, Pastor Tim kicked off this series by taking a look at the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter five, verses one through 12. And he taught us how, how Jesus wants to reform our values from being people who value things of this world like power and strength to being people who value things of the kingdom of God like humility and mercy and meekness. Last week, we looked at Matthew 5, 13 through 20 and learned how Jesus wants to reform our view of influence because the world has formed us into people who, who seek power and prestige to influence a big amount of people for our own gain. But Jesus wants us to be reformed to where we seek discipleship truly changed lives so that we can reach the people in our immediate vicinity for God's good. This week, we are continuing our series through the Sermon on the Mount as we look at how Jesus calls us to be reformed in our relationships, specifically how we are to deal with our anger in our relationships. So if you are able, would you stand for the reading of God's word this morning? From Matthew chapter 5, Verses 21 through 26. Hear the word of the Lord. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court. Anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your, with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. 
Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our passage this morning is the first of six topics that Jesus addresses in Matthew chapter 5 that biblical scholars refer to as the antithesis. It's the whole section where Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And the word antithesis means something that is in the direct opposite of something else, something in opposition to something else. And so the classic understanding of what Jesus is doing here looks a little something like this, where Jesus' teaching has two elements, the Old Testament passage and his teaching. And these two things are really set as being against one another, And the idea is that Jesus does this with all six topics in Matthew 5, with murder and adultery, with divorce and oath-taking and revenge and loving one's neighbor. And that in all of these, Jesus' teaching is twofold. You've heard it said, but I say to you, and these things are pitted against each other. But in the words of Eric Barreto, professor at Princeton, If we're not careful, we might mistakenly hear Jesus proclaiming, you've previously heard this commandment, but now I'm setting a new one before you. For the law was inadequate and insufficient and is thus now no longer applicable. And here is a whole new set of commandments. But as Pastor Tim explained last week in the verse just before this passage, Jesus says, do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. If Jesus hasn't come to abolish the law, then why do we insist on pitting his teachings in this passage against it? I think some of the reason for this can be traced back to our understanding of the word that we translate as fulfill. Tim touched on this last week, but I think it's really important for this passage and worth reiterating. Jesus fulfilling the law doesn't mean that he finished it and now it's over. Jesus fulfills the law because he perfectly obeyed what the law commanded, revealed the true intent of the law. Here's another way to understand this. The Greek word that we translate as fulfilled is the word plerao, and it literally means filled up. This word is found elsewhere in the gospels. Let's take a look at those and see if this might help us understand John 12, three, Mary anoints the feet of Jesus with costly perfume. And the scriptures say that the house was filled with the fragrance. The house was play rao with the fragrance. In Matthew 15, 37, after the feeding of the multitude, after everyone had eaten and they picked up what was left over of broken pieces of bread and fish, they had seven baskets full, seven baskets play rao. So what this word means was that there was something that was there, a house or baskets, and then something else comes along and fits perfectly within them, like the fragrance of a perfume or the pieces of bread and fish. There's a visual that Dr. Steve Mann at APU Seminary uses that I thought was really helpful. So I'll attempt to do it half as good as he does. Let's pretend this vase is the Old Testament law and the water is Jesus. Jesus says, do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I haven't come to abolish, but to play rao, to fill it. The law and the prophets were there and Jesus came along and fits perfectly within them. Jesus is not the end of the law. Jesus fills it out, fills it up, colors it in, shows us its true potential, its true form, its true capacity. Rather than understanding that Jesus has come and fulfilled the law, meaning it's no longer there, it's finished, and he's teaching something completely new, we understand that Jesus filled up the law, filled it out, colored it in. We understand that just because the vase was filled with the water, doesn't mean the vase is no longer there. The water merely helps us understand the vase's true form and its capacity. So Jesus's ministry fits perfectly within the law, 
So much so that if you don't understand the form of scripture, the form of the law and the prophets, then you won't understand what Jesus is doing. And on the other hand, if you don't understand what Jesus is doing, then that shows that you never really understood the law and the prophets. That was the problem the Pharisees had. They were supposed to be experts in the law, and yet they didn't understand what Jesus was doing, which showed that they didn't really understand it at all. So coming back to our scripture this morning, how are we to understand then this passage where Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Pastor Tim and I have been impacted by two former Fuller Seminary professors, David Gushy and Glenn Stassen, for pointing out that in each time Jesus cites the Old Testament here, he does not follow this twofold pattern. You have heard it said, but I say to you. In fact, he follows a threefold pattern. First, Jesus gives the Old Testament command. Then he describes a malforming cycle, a pattern of behavior that often leads people to break that command. And then he gives the view of a reforming practice, something that we can do to really fully live out the spirit of the command that God gave. So here in Matthew, 20, Matthew 5, 21 through 26, the Old Testament command Jesus quotes is, do not murder. It's the sixth commandment. By repeating it, Jesus is reiterating its importance. The malforming cycle then, the pattern of behavior that often leads people to break this command begins with anger. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. In other words, unchecked anger escalates. It spirals, it builds, it goes out of control. Jesus here uses the example of violent words being said to someone. And we all know that words can be a form of violence, right? There's a reason we call it character assassination or stabbing someone in the back or murdering someone's reputation, killing their confidence, cutting them down to size. Words can cause damage that hurt just as much as any physical wound. Words of anger can be violent, and that same anger that leads us to violent words can also lead us to violent action and even murder. All of it has the same root, anger left unchecked, undealt with. So what are we to do? How do we get out of this malforming cycle, this pattern of behavior? Well, thankfully, Jesus also gives us a reforming practice. And it's called a practice because we have to practice it. <laughs> Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Go and be reconciled to them. Be reconciled. Go make it right. Apologize. And do it quickly. <laughs> Don't let the anger escalate and build and bubble up. Go and make it right. Jesus here is taking the form of this Old Testament command, do not murder, and he's filling it up and filling it out and coloring it in and showing us its true capacity. As the people of God, we are missing the point if we think the command of do not murder means don't take someone else's life. We're missing the point if we think that everything that we do to someone up to that point brings honor to God, right? <laughs> We're missing the point if we think our angry words and our attacks on people's character and their reputation are honoring to God. Our denomination has a wonderful way of putting this. If you've been through the Belong class in the last year or so, you would have read this when it explains the 10 commandments or for those who are in it right now, we went over it this week. But ECO, our denomination says, do not murder. In other words, eradicate the spirit of anger, resentment, callousness, violence, or bitterness. Eradicate it. Instead, cultivate a spirit of gentleness, kindness, peace, and love. Recognize and honor the image of God in every person. So do not take someone's life might be the form of the law but it is not the law fully filled out. 
when it's filled in, colored in, we see the bigger picture that we are called to live lives of reconciliation with other people of recognizing and honoring the image of God that every person that you will ever interact with is made in. in. This threefold pattern of Jesus' teaching show us that this Old Testament command, do not murder, still applies. It's still important. That there is also a malforming cycle that we can easily fall into of our anger spiraling out of control. But that there is a way to be reformed to get out of that anger spiral, the practice of reconciliation can reform us as the people of God. Jesus is laying out a Christian ethic of reconciled relationships, the way we are all called to live with other people. Our relationships should be marked not by anger and violence and harsh words. No, our our relationships should be marked by a spirit of gentleness and kindness and peace and love because you were made in the image of God and so was every other person. How do you deal with your anger? And it's a legitimate question at this point in the sermon, I think, to say, is Jesus saying that we should never be angry? Is do not be angry the the main takeaway from this passage? Throughout the Bible, there are references to God being angry. The wrath of God is a phrase that you find all over the Old Testament. And it's God's response to things in the world like injustice and lack of care for the poor, people taking advantage of one another and harming one another. These behaviors stir up the wrath of God, the anger of God. The New Testament even shows us that Jesus was angry when he saw that people were taking advantage of the poor, profiteering in the temple courts. We look at the book of Ephesians and we see in chapter four, verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And it's not just the New Testament that flat out says it, that's actually referencing an Old Testament passage in the Psalms. Psalms four, four through five says, be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts, on your own beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. So scripture seems to differentiate anger from sin. So is Jesus saying here, do not be angry, that anger is a sin, that anger is the same as murder? I don't think so. In this world, we can't help but be angry sometimes. When we see injustice and unfairness and hypocrisy and violence, anger is a natural response to those things. I think sometimes anger means that we are paying attention. But if we look at Jesus' outline of that threefold pattern, then we see that Jesus gives us a solution. Do not murder, do not, is not, do not be angry. Jesus is saying, do not, be, do not murder. The malforming cycle begins with anger, letting your anger spew out on other people. But the reforming practice is be reconciled. Jesus isn't saying, do not be angry. He's saying, don't let your anger get the best of you. Don't get caught up in your anger, deal with it. Be careful not to fall into that malforming practice of lashing out at others and calling them names, attacking their character. Don't brood and let your anger grow and grow. Don't feed it, don't stoke the fire. Don't let anger take the reins. Deal with your anger before your anger deals with you. Anger is not a sin, but it can easily lead to it. So deal with it. Recognize your anger, pay attention to it, understand it, get help with it. Deal with your anger before your anger deals with you, before you lash out at other people. But when you do, go and be reconciled. Make it right. Because it is in the seeking of reconciliation that we are reformed by the character of God. In seeking reconciliation, we become the people of God, representatives of God's reconciliation. 
This is a difficult lesson, but it's an important one because here's the truth. We are going to let one another down. In friendships, in marriage, in church, in family, at work, we are going to hurt each other. There is going to be conflict somewhere, sometime. It's gonna happen. But what we do as a response to that conflict shows who we are and whose we are. Is our response to conflict giving into our anger? Is it letting our anger deal with us? Or is our response to conflict to seek reconciliation, to make it right, to apologize? And I wanna point out something else about this passage. This passage isn't speaking to us necessarily when we are the ones who've been on the receiving end of the anger. This isn't necessarily speaking to us when we have been wronged. It's speaking to us when we are the people who have wronged someone else. Jesus does speak to the other side of that later in chapter five when he speaks about revenge, but you're gonna have to wait a few weeks for that sermon. (laughs) But notice the language in this passage. If anyone who says Raka, if anyone who says you fool, if you remember that someone has something against you, this is speaking to us when we are in the wrong. And in case we have any doubt about that, Jesus speaks about being found guilty, taken to the judge and handed over to the jailer, put in jail and being made to repay everything we owe to make it right. And I have to admit, until preparing for the sermon, I never noticed that. It actually took me talking this sermon out to someone else for them to point it out to me. Because the entire, my entire life when I've read this, I always assumed it was speaking to me when I was the injured party. Because it's really difficult for me to think that I'm the guilty one in the story. I mean, I don't mean to hurt anybody. How could I, like half the time, I don't even know that I'm doing it. How can I be the bad guy in the story? We're always the hero in it. (laughs) But this is speaking to me when I have hurt someone. This is speaking to us when we have hurt someone. And I think that takes a brain shift because all too often we identify with the victim in the story or with the one who comes in and saves the victim we are almost never wired to uh, influence, to identify with the person who is guilty in the story. Our world has formed us into people who can't even see when we've done wrong to someone. The world teaches us never admit when you're wrong, don't show weakness, don't apologize. Sure, I may have done something really small to someone, (laughs) but can you believe they did that? (laughs) How dare they be offended? I'm offended that they're offended. I'm really the victim now. And eventually when we deny our own wrongdoing for long enough, we begin to believe it. We we become unable to see when we have hurt someone else, unable to grasp the reality of it. And if we cannot see when we have harmed someone else, how can we ever be reconciled with them? In this passage, it is the responsibility of the person who's done the wrong to make it right. But if we think we've never done anything wrong, how can we be agents of God's reconciliation in the world? If we are not first the people who can listen and recognize when we're in the wrong, we cannot be agents of reconciliation. Because as mad as I was that my neighbor had sent me that rude text as mad as I was that she was unnecessarily mean, and as much as I wanted to make her out to be the offender in the whole thing, in reality, my tree was trespassing on her property and causing her problems. It didn't matter that I didn't know about it. It didn't matter I didn't even live there anymore. It didn't matter that I didn't intend to offend her. As angry as I got reading and rereading and brooding over the text, In reality, if she had reported me to the HOA, I would have been found guilty and would have had to make it right. It didn't matter, I didn't know, or how insignificant I thought her complaint was. I was still the guilty party. 
And like the person in the scripture, I could have been taken to the court and found guilty and been required to repay it. And as silly as that example is, (laughs) it paints the picture, right? Does that mean that she was justified in speaking to me the way she did? Does that mean that she can do whatever she wants because I was in the wrong first? I think those are the wrong questions. I am still called to live as a person of reconciliation no matter how my neighbor acts. It doesn't matter the way that she behaves because I still know what I am called to as a person who follows Jesus. And I need to, know, need to do what is in my power to make right. I do not always live up to this. <laughs> but I take comfort in the fact that when I try, when I feel the anger bubbling up and when I stop and calm down and deal with it and then go try to make it right, I take comfort in the fact that in that act of reconciliation, in seeking that, God is working in me to reform me. It gives me hope that I will not always be stuck in the same place dealing with the same issue every time because that is the implied promise in this passage, that we are not left alone to deal with our anger. Jesus does indeed speak of the malforming cycle of anger we get stuck in, but he also gives us the reforming practice that he uses to restore the image of God within us. Go, be reconciled. And when we practice reconciliation, especially in response to the people who we have done wrong to, we can rest assured that God is working in us, reforming us into people of his reconciliation. So Jesus' command isn't, do not be angry. Jesus' command is, go be reconciled. Are we people of reconciliation? Are we people who listen to the hurt of others and recognize when we are in the wrong and seek to make it right? Are we people who deal with our anger? Or are we people whose anger deals with us? Who get in that anger spiral and spew our anger out on everyone around us? Who cut people down to size with our words and attack their character? If someone was looking at our lives from a completely objective perspective, what would they see? in the way we interact with others, in the posts we share on social media, in the way we handle conflict, and how we respond to being called out on our behavior. Jesus says, do not murder, deal with your anger, go be reconciled. May we be a people who deal with our anger before it deals with us. May we be people who not only follow the rough outline of the law, but who are marked by the spirit of reconciliation that Jesus calls us to. May we be a people who are reformed by the power of God at work in our lives. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Gracious God, we come before you humbled by your words in this passage knowing that not one of us truly lives up to being a person that is completely a representative of your reconciliation. We seek your help and we ask that you would work in our lives to reform us into people who can proudly say that we seek reconciliation, that we are aware when we are in the wrong and we go to try to make it right. We love you, Jesus. And it is in your name that we pray, amen.